You know, when I was a, when I was a little girl, I watched The Wizard of Oz. It was kind of scary in some places for me, but when I saw Glenda coming in that big iridescent bubble, and she came down, and all of a sudden she just was there with this beautiful dress and a crown and a, and a magic wand, and, and then she just kind of waved that, and everything became better. And I thought, wow. That's what I want to be when I grow up, like Glenda. And then I started watching TV, and I saw Superman on TV. They had Superman programs when I was little, and I thought, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to fly, and I want to be able to just swoop down and, and save the good guys from the bad guys. Okay, so how about you guys? Anybody ever want to be a superhero? <laughs> Did you pick out kind of the people that you wanted to be when you were when you were growing up? Yeah, I think that's normal for us. And we all we we just want to be able to fix things and help people. If you love them, you don't want them to suffer. You don't want them to die. You don't want them to get angry and yell at each other or do dumb things and get hurt. If we could stop the pandemic, if we could stop motorcycle crashes and hurricanes, gosh, we would. So it seems just, it seems just right and understandable that in this gospel story that we read today about Jesus and Peter, that, that Peter would try everything he could to keep his Lord, his Savior, his best friend from doing what Jesus said was about to happen, that he was going to go to Jerusalem, that he was going to suffer, that he would be abused and, and tortured, and that he would be killed. This must not happen to you, Peter says, in his passionate love for Jesus. He wanted only what was best for Jesus, right? And it... It must have really hurt when Jesus turned around and reprimanded him, saying, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. I can, I can just imagine Jesus crying right there. I mean, this, this wasn't something he was saying to his enemy these were words for his best friend on earth, for Peter. And just before this had happened with Peter, Peter had made the great faith statement. When Jesus asked all the disciples, who do people say that I am? And, and some of them said, well, some people say you're a prophet or a teacher. And, and Jesus said, I know, but, but who do you say? Who do you say that I am? And, and Peter stood up and he said, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. <laughs> and Jesus said, good for you, Peter. On this rock, I will build my church and nothing can ever overcome it. And then, whomp. Peter says just the wrong thing. <sighs> so temptations like. Peter tried to tempt Jesus from following the will of God, which was that Jesus would suffer and die. Now, we know, we know from following this story that this, this was terribly hard for Jesus. In his humanness as the Son of Man, this was difficult. So hearing Peter's words made it harder. But it was the Father's will. And Jesus did this for our sake. 
But Peter, in his, in his blind passion, with his eyes only on what he wanted, what he thought was best, said what we, what we see, what we hear, as being so caring in our earthly concern. We think of temptations as things like stealing or lying or committing adultery, and those for sure are temptations. But the greatest temptation, the greatest harm is done when we stop following God's will or when we try to prevent someone else. Satan is very tricky. He will use any means to separate us from God's will. One of the greatest weapons he has is our will. Are you keeping your mind on divine things, acknowledging God in everything that you do so that God can direct your path? Or are we putting our minds on our will, on human things? You are so precious to God that Satan, Satan will use you he will use any underhanded scheme. He will use suffering. He will use half-truths. He will even twist around the good intentions of our families and our friends. This is real, and this is important. It's so important that Jesus confronts his best friends with words that get their attention. So they will stop and see what they're doing. They're listening to Satan. They are not listening to God's will. It was God's will that Jesus would suffer and die. God's will that Jesus would go to a cross. Because no human being can take down the power of sin except Jesus Christ. Jesus took all sin all sin into his body and he nailed it to the cross so that he could have the victory over sin so that Peter and you and me and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren would never have to experience an eternal death that we will always live knowing that we have the grace of God. Are you putting your mind on divine things or on worldly things right now? My will or thy will be done. So I'll be honest, I'm a lot like Peter. I, I want to fix everything. I really do. I still do. And I want God to do my will. And I have to continually pray and ask God to help me learn to be obedient to his will, his timing, his plans. If you don't know God's plans, ask. I'm not God. And that's very good. God is God. God's plans are better than anything that I could ever come up with for myself or for anyone else. We may have to suffer. We may have to walk with people that we love through their suffering. We all have crosses to bear. But I have learned that as we walk through those ourselves and with people that we love, loving them, caring for them, accompanying them, praying for them, God will strengthen us and our faith. Do you remember Job? He lost everything. But he kept his faith. And in the end, God restored everything. That's God's plan for you. If you want to save your life and the lives of those that you love, by your power, by your fixing things for them, 
by your wealth or by your intelligence and not God's, you will lose it. But those of you who let God save your life and the lives of those you love, trusting and following his plans, his timing, his purpose, you will find your life. And I want to make a distinction here. It's not that we don't do all that we can to help other people. We do. We use the gifts that God has given us. We ask God to direct us. It's when we're trying to fix and stop, as Peter did, that we get in the way of God's will. It's important to make that distinction. And the way we do it is by focusing on God's will. And one of the wonderful ways that I want to show you that today is just what we read earlier. In Romans 8, what I would like you to do this week is to open up your Bibles at home and at work, wherever you are. Open it up to Romans 8 this week. And as you walk by it, as you get up in the morning, as you go to bed at night, open this in your bedroom, wherever you have. Put all those Bibles all around your house. This is God's will for us, my friends. This is God's will. To let your love be genuine and authentic toward others. To put evil behind you. Get behind me, Satan. Whenever you have to say that, when you just feel those thoughts coming into your mind, those words, get behind me. Hold on to what is good. Hold on to that. Practice that mutual and respectful love toward other people. Be hopeful. Be hopeful. Find those things that are hopeful in your life. Be patient in suffering. Pray all the time. Provide hospitality to people who are different, to the strangers. Bless those who are mean to you. Bless them. Be happy with people who are happy and with people who are sad. Listen, sit down with them, weep with them. Think of other people as being better than yourself. When you look into another person, especially if it's someone that it's hard for you right now to love, look at them and see Jesus in that person. Be peaceful. Let God be the judge. Overcome evil with good. This, my friends, is God's will. This week and every week. Put your mind on those divine things. We're entering a season right now of great testing in our nation. It's important to focus our minds on those divine things of God, that will of God for us. And my dear friends, God bless you. God bless us all as we live in this way. Amen.